Now let's bow in a wee word of prayer before we open and read the Scriptures this morning. Our Father and God, this morning we do thank Thee for the wonderful gospel invitation that is still being extended today, that whosoever shall call upon the Lord and the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if there's anyone just here now that's not saved, that this will be the day that they will now accept the invitation and know sins forgiven, will know peace with God, and will know assurance of heaven and of home. And so, Lord, now as we turn to Thine own inspired Word. Again, we would pray we would hear Thy voice, and we pray, Lord, that Thy Word will be a blessing to all of our hearts, for it's through our Savior's name we pray. Amen and amen. We're turning this morning to Paul's letter to the Romans, and we're in Romans chapter number 8, please. Romans Paul's letter to the Romans, and we're in chapter number 8. Paul's letter to the Romans, please. And we're in chapter number 8, and we're going to break in the chapter at verse number 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the, the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man saith, why doth he yet hope for? For if we hope for, if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for, as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good, to them that love God, and to them who are the called according to His purpose. Amen. And we know 
that the Lord will add His blessing to that public reading again from His own precious truth. There's a lesson the Lord wants us to learn from, from His message this morning. It's a lesson so many people struggle with, struggle to learn. It's a lesson this morning that so many God's people, so many of God's people find it very hard to accept the time. God wants us to understand something this morning. It doesn't matter how godly you may be. It doesn't matter how Christ-like we are. And it doesn't matter how close we walk with God. There may come things into our lives that leaves it very difficult, if not, leaves it or leaves us finding it impossible to understand why. You see, child of God, things do come into our lives, and things can happen, and those things bring with them questions to which we find no answer. And sometimes we struggle with it, and maybe there's someone here this morning, and you're struggling with some situation. Maybe it's something you're finding it very difficult to handle at present. There can come times, child of God, even to the most godly, even to the most Christly, where the bitterness of life outweighs the sweetness of life. Where the bad outweighs the good. Where the wrong outweighs the right. And there can come that point where you and where I cannot get our heads around it as to why these things come and as to why these things happen. And I wonder this morning, is there someone here and you find yourself there? Just this week, as I was conducting the mission in Koch, I spent an afternoon with Pastor David Scott, one of the most godliest we men, one of the most gracious we men. The same today sitting in a wheelchair, No power down the right side. Speech gone. Friends, you wonder why a wee man like that, so godly, so gracious, is struck down just to be left the way it is. Break your heart, you know. Then there's all our friends of ours, personal friends. 
One of them has to go in very shortly for a biopsy. And this lady, you call her Heather. And Heather, and I've always said this, Heather is the closest person you'll ever get to meeting an angel. She's an angel. And she discovered a lump here. And it's cancerous. And things like this come to the child of God. And things like this happen. And mind you, there's no answers for the question, why? And in a natural sense, nothing makes sense. When you see the like of Pastor Scott and, and Heather and and others, and the rascals go free. You wonder what is going on. But here's a wee lesson God wants us to learn just at this moment. Adversities, adversities misunderstood. Adversities looked upon from the human perspective is a double curse. Why? Because they attack our faith in God. And it can even affect our fellowship with, with God. God's message this morning comes from a well-known verse. And it's this verse that has been weighed heavily upon my heart for this morning. It's often quoted. It is often challenged. It's Romans 8, verse 28. Paul writes and he says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to His purpose. There are situations that are hard to handle. But see, it Spurgeon says God sometimes sends his love letters in black-edged envelopes. When all seems out of hand, and when we feel forgotten, and when we feel forsaken, it's at them times that we have to breathe out with the voice of faith. God is faith. As I was with Pastor Scott this week, even in a situation, he could do nothing but laugh and smile as we chatted. He's a man this morning that I learned from this week. Even in the greatest of adversities, he can see God in it. I want you to notice that verse, Romans 8, 28. First of all, take a look at the certainty of the text. Because it says this, And we know. That's the secret of the text this morning. Sometimes we're quoted by just simply saying, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call of according to His, pur to, to His purpose. Ah, but here's the opening words this morning that's vitally important. And we know. 
That's the certainty of the text this morning. And we know this is the absolute assurance. The, this is the door that closes out doubt. Here it is where faith outweighs the feelings. It's here where we see the sense, even though things are senseless. Do you remember Abraham? Abraham was told that Sarah would bear a child. And, but do you know what we read in Romans 4? It said this, even when, when this promise didn't make sense, and it says that Abraham staggered not at the promise that God had given. You know, child of God, I wonder are you staggering at the promises of God? You're not fully standing this morning upon the promises of God. Abraham could say, and what he has promised, he is able to perform. When things come, when things come, and we can't make head nor tail of it. We can't make sense. And when things come into our own lives, child of God, that would almost drive you to despair. Are there words this morning that can bring us comfort? Are there words this morning that can console when these times come? I think we have to turn to Jeremiah 29 and 11, where God says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I was just sitting before the Lord this week with this text in mind, and I couldn't help but think of the man who penned these words, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. I couldn't help but think of Paul's experience. Because, you see, the one who penned Romans 8, 28, knew only too well when situations went horribly wrong that he thought. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, he said, Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. Spent a day and a night in the deep. And yet this man who was thrice beaten with rods, once stoned, thrice suffered shipwreck, spent a night and a day out in the deep. It's him who could say, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Do you know what Job could say? In spite of what Job lost, in, je in spite of what Job suffered, Job could say, for I know I know my Redeemer liveth. Why do we worry? Why is it so easy we can lose sight of God? It's, it's because, child of God, you nor I don't know what is best for us. I want you to notice something else about that text this morning. There's the certainty of the text, but notice the complex of this text. Because it says, and we know that all things, all things, not some things, not most things, all things work together for good. Do you know, child of God, what God wants you and me to understand? God uses the bad as well as the good. 
God uses the bitter as well as the sweet. God uses the dark colors as well as the bright. God weaves the black threads and uses the black threads to make the tapestry of life more beautiful. You ladies knows what it's like when you're baking. There's a lot of sour things and there's a lot of bitter things has to go into the recipes. And to put all them together in a bowl and to sup it with a spoon, you couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. But they're all part and parcel of the ingredients of the mixture to make that which will turn out beautiful. All things. all things. You see, God controls all things. God's in control of the awful things. God's in control of the better things. God is in control of whatever comes into your life. God allows these things to come in, child of God, even though this morning we cannot see it. Granny Armstrong used to say, the bitter herbs are useful when you know how to use them. I wonder what bitter ingredient has fell into your life. Maybe it's sorrow. That's your case this morning. And it's hard to handle. Maybe it's sickness this morning. Maybe it's loss. But it's that bitter ingredient that has come into your life. Fred Orr, in 1949, from the Castle Ray Road, married a young lady called Ina McMurray. Both of them left these shores to sail to the mission field in Brazil with the Acre Gospel Mission. Ten days into that journey, Fred Orr's wife fell to a fever, a fever that that claimed her life. Nobody else on the steamer could speak English. Here was this man going out to Brazil along with his wife to bring the gospel to the sinners there, leaving the shores of his own land to go away across the sea to bring God's wonderful message to the people there. And here is dear wife of only 29 succumbs to a fever and dies. The first job Fred Orr had to do, do it on his own, when he reached the other side, was not to preach the gospel at all, 
but to bury his wife. A bitter blow. A bitter blow that would have turned most of us here, including myself. But Fred Orr went on. And I remember Fred Orr one Tuesday evening in Mournview Assembly. It might have been the last time he was there, sharing with us of that experience. And this is how he described it. That bitter blow was part and parcel of God's plan. And we know that all things And some of them old thing, all things, leaves it impossible to understand. There's a wee hymn, and I think it, it's very true. I am not skilled to understand, but God hath willed what God hath planned. But I only know what His right hand stands one who, who is my Savior. Do you see the certainty in that text, and we know? Do you see the complex in that text, that all things? Notice the completeness in the text, that all things work together for good. You see, Paul doesn't look at the present. He looks at the final outcome. All things work together for good. That day when Naaman's maid was taken by the Syrians away down to Syria, I suppose at that time she couldn't understand why, but, but look at the good that came out of it. There's hundreds of people in heaven today because of it. Think of Joseph, the day he was sold to the Ishmaelites. Joseph couldn't see sense in it at the very time. Ah, but away down in the years that lay ahead, Joseph could say of his brethren, ye meant it for evil. God meant it for good. You want to know something? Sometimes God, God this morning can use the very devil to bring out the good in us. God can use the wicked to bring out the best. It was a dark night, it was. Oh, a dark winter's night. A wee Pentecostal church sitting on the side of a mountain in South Armagh, Darkly Mountain Lodge. On that evening, Sunday evening it was, Three armed and masked men burst in, shooting dead three of its elders and injuring many more. You would often wonder, why would God allow something like that to happen? What good could come out of 
evil such as that. Many a time I have preached in darkly, and I know the pastor down there well, Pastor Bell. Remember him bringing me into the wee hut? The wee church is still there. They've built another church now. But the wee hut where the atrocity happened, I remember him bringing me into it. And it's an absolute miracle that there wasn't more dead. David said, as three men died in this wee hall, as a result, we receive letters from all over the world from people who have given their lives to Christ because of the recording of the shooting that was played over the news. You know the hymn they were singing when they burst in? It was the last verse of that great hymn. There is a… F no, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside your garments that are, white with, or that are stained with sin. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And right, the, right away you could hear the gunshot. You see, this is things we need to understand, child of God. These are things we ought to know. That in all things, that all things work together for good. God can turn evil for our good. In God's hands intended, evil can become an eventual good. We'll go back to you, ladies. And I know some of you in here are good at the bacon. That's why I've put on weight since I've come. You put all the mixture together, it doesn't taste like much. Sure it doesn't. But when you put all that mixture into the oven and it hits the right temperature, it all becomes beautiful in its time. God takes the better thing. God takes the sour things, and in His time, and according to His way, it becomes good, even though we don't know why. We know that all things work together for good. And God's intention, His overall intention, is to conform you and I into the image of His Son. I want you to notice, thirdly, the condition of this text. Because this is what Paul says, and we know that all things work together for good. Here's the condition. To them that love God, and to them who are the called of His purpose. There's a lovely wee verse in the book of Proverbs, you know. Proverbs 12, verse 21. There shall be no evil happen to the just. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that the saved and the just will escape evil. It doesn't mean that the saved and the just will escape the bad things in life. But this is what it does mean. It means this. Evil and bad things will never have their own way in the life of the believer. Whatever better thing comes, whatever evil thing is allowed, God will be under total control of it because we are His child. And child of God this morning, perhaps this morning, perhaps 
You're going through something that's torturing you. God wants you to know He is in control of it. Satan was allowed to attack Job, but Satan was under the command of God, under the authority of God. And anything that Satan done was only because God allowed it and God told them so far and no more. When you're a child of God, you're under God's care, dear. And when you're a child of God, brother, you're under His care. And whatever must or may come, you remember this. And you get yourself to this place where you can say, we know even though I don't understand it, even though I can't get my head around it, even though I can't find any answers, just you breathe out. God is faithful. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the call according to His purpose. Fred Orr, Jim Elliot, Many of the great men of God suffered great blows. But Paul could say this, for our late affliction is which but for a moment worketh for us, not against us, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, for the things which are seen are but temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When nothing makes sense, God is faithful. For we know, we know that all things, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Whatever it is, all will be well. And may God bless His Word to our hearts this morning. Our closing hymn is 578.